The content herein is for informational purposes only, not intended as medical advice, diagnosis or treatment, and is not to be substituted for direct advice from your doctor. Today's LymphCast program is proudly sponsored by Vita Support MD, the makers of Vein Formula 1000 and Lymphatic Formula 1000. These MPFF-based nutraceuticals are backed by science and recommended by doctors specializing in venous and lymphatic disorders. Visit VitaSupportMD.com to learn more. Greetings and welcome to our LymphCast show, episode 59. We thank you for being with us. As a reminder, visit our website early and often. Everything is there, news and updates, every episode you can find there. And that is LymphCastNetwork.com. If you have a question for anybody on the panel, email us at hello at LymphCastNetwork.com. Every episode is on every podcast platform under the sun. And every episode is also on YouTube. How about that? You can see what we look like. Let's go around the table and meet the panel from California, Dr. Emily Eicher. Hello, Dr. Eicher. How are you? Hello, Paul, and hello, team. And uh, I am looking forward to our exciting session today about wound care. Absolutely. From Arizona, Dr. Monica Glavitsky. Hello, Dr. Glavitsky. How are you today? Hello, team, and hello, everybody. And uh, most of all, hello, our distinguished guest, uh, Dr. Melin and uh, David Armstrong. All right, we will bring them in in just a moment. The gentleman who started the show, he's the founder and owner of this show. He's also the founder and owner of Ida Support MD. They make vein formula 1000 and lymphatic formula 1000 from New Jersey physician, surgeon, Dr. John A. Chuback. Hello, Dr. Chuback. How are you? Hi, Paul. Thank you very much. I'm doing fine. Good to see everybody. Looking forward, have been looking forward to tonight's show for a long time. Absolutely. It's going to be power pack and terrific. So let's get to it. Dr. Chuback, I'll hand it back to you. If you want to bring our guests in, we will be off and running. Sure. I'm going to begin by introducing um, dear uh, colleague and friend, David uh, Armstrong. Uh, Dr. Armstrong is um, trained uh, as a podiatrist and in podiatric surgery, also has his PhD and is clearly um, an internationally recognized figure in the world of podiatric surgery, but especially uh, well known internationally for his work on diabetic foot and limb preservation. And um, he's joined today with uh, our dear friend, Dr. Mark Moline, who I'll introduce in just a moment. And the overlap here today is definitely their interest in tissue repair and wound healing. And Dr. Armstrong um, is the founder and co-director of the uh, Southwestern Academic Limb Salvage Alliance, uh, SALSA, and is also the director of USC's Center um, to Stream Healthcare in Place. Um, and he's a major player uh, in research related to diabetic foot and wearable technologies and other health technologies and his resume is too long to go through. He speaks all over the country and all over the world. He's received tremendous accolades. And if I'm not mistaken, my understanding is he has the most peer-reviewed uh, publications at the USC uh, Keck School of Medicine, which is quite uh, something to say. Our second guest is Dr. Mark Moline, who is a dear friend for a long time. Mark is a trained vascular surgeon, trained with Dr. Uh, Peter Glavitsky at the Mayo Clinic, did his general surgical training and vascular surgical training at Mayo, um, and has had a very long and accomplished and illustrious career as a vascular surgeon, had significant exp uh, experience in this area of vein care and uh, chronic venous disease, and also an expert on wound care, and is now back at his alma mater at the Mayo Clinic, having spent some time at the University of Minnesota, and also a world-renowned figure lecturing, speaking, teaching, and conducting research. So Dr. Armstrong, Dr. Moline, welcome to the show, and thank you so much for being here. Man, it's a total pleasure. After an intro like that, Dr. Chubak, you can only be disappointed. So everyone, buckle up for that disappointment. <laughs> Not for Malene, just for the toe doctor. Here. <laughs> hey, I'm I'm an I'm an endothelial cell doctor, and I'm just going to get the word out right now. Glycocalyx. That way, it takes the pressure off everybody. 
<laughs> and we can just kind of proceed on and it's just going to be a wonderful uh, conversation here. But, you know, I, I got to start off with one story, John. Uh, I, I had the great privilege of meeting Dr. Armstrong initially at one of my favorite wound care meetings. It's called Innovations in Wound Healing down in Florida. And I'm in the audience and and he's up giving this phenomenal presentation. He was kind enough to entertain a question for me, you know, late in the evening after that whole meeting was over. And I just said, diabetic lower extremity ulcers and edema, don't you think we could enhance outcomes and decrease recidivism by dealing with this edema thing? And, you know, David, you were so kind. You emailed me that night your 2000 paper that you had done with KCI on that pump that did edema reduction. And here we sit, that paper was published 24 years ago, and there's still conversation going on about compression in diabetics. Most Ian Parch have written great papers on this. Mayor Ravitz has written papers. And, you know, I hope coming out of tonight's conversation, we really talk about how are we going to address this issue and how are we really going to start to advance the subject of limb salvage by recognizing lymphatic dysfunction in diabetic foot? So I'm just going to kick it off with that question, John, right away as we kind of get going here. Well, I look forward to hearing it. I just do want to say one thing, Mark. You know, there's a great there's a great quote um, from uh, a player who played with Wilt uh, Chamberlain. And he tells a great story. He says, I'll never forget the night that Wilt and I combined for 101 points. Wilt had 100. I had one. So <laughs> I tell a similar story about me and Dave Armstrong. I don't know how many publications he has, but I'll never forget the time we combined for, let's say, 2001 published articles. Dave had 2,000. I had one. So <laughs> together, we're, we're, an unbelievable, <laughs> we're an unbelievable force in academic medicine. But that being said... Dave, why don't you pick up where, where Mark has, has gotten us going, if you don't mind? Well, look, I, I think that was a superb uh, way to get started. I, you know, I I uh, speak to, I, you know, I, I think actually uh, uh, Monica may have uh, spent time in uh, uh, in Paris with, uh, uh, and I think, weren't, weren't you at the Salpêtrière? Uh, 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 I I um, I was, uh, but only as a uh, as a uh, fellow uh, in the phlebology program. So it well, was well, more well, well, I bring this up because that is where, and this is gonna. I promise I'm gonna bring it home. This is gonna be like a big, like a Flaubert novel. It's gonna be all just crazy <laughs> and finally stream of consciousness. And but the point is that actually that's the home of uh, of. Uh, in addition to where Princess Diana died, uh, it also was the home of Jean-Martin Charcot or J.M. Charcot. And, and he is the father of Grand Rounds and neurology and all this stuff. Yeah. But he uh, you know, has a problem uh, that, uh, uh, that first really interested me in, in, in edema, which is Charcot arthropathy. Uh, and I always called it just like, uh, uh, you know, just like uh, 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 Churchill called Russia, he called it a, a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside of an enigma. I call uh, uh, Charcot an enigma wrapped in edema. But mm. but the problem is is that the, the, it, these diabetic feet in general, especially those with wounds, and and Mark had brought this up before, are profoundly enigmatic. You know, it's just where there this problem. Uh, edema is a surrogate marker, or is it a cause or effect? What's the chicken and egg? with chronic inflammation uh, um, and how can we identify it? How can we uh, then reverse it? And how can we be more aggressive about it? And I think we have sort of blown it off, frankly, uh, in uh, surgery and medicine. Uh, I think also in innovation um, over the last, um, I'd say, I mean, since time immemorial. And I think our patients, you know, deserve better uh, uh, frankly, I mean, I'd love to hear what Mark says and also John, of course. Well, I, I look at the dermal lymphatic system as it's the immune system. It's soft tissue regeneration when we activate it. Dermal lymphatic stasis is incredibly inflammatory, contributes to the underlying edema. And if we can improve endothelial cell function, nitric oxide release, improve that Gore-Tex layer so we have less hyperpermeability, yeah. inflammation, uh, decrease in appropriate coagulopathies, I think we can win the game because if we can get the body to heal itself, because the body, every cell in our body is so much smarter than us. And um, so we, we've got to figure out ways to to do that. That'll democratize, as Ada talks about, democratize 
dealing with this problem. Uh, it's much going to be much more cost effective. The other component we're missing is understanding single nucleotide polymorphisms. How do you bring the genetic uh, abnormalities into this? I met with the Abbott folks this morning. Great. And, you know, and, you know, you, you've done such a great job in publications on arginine, uh, hydroxymethylbutyrate, uh, and um, that wonderful concoction that has great output. But there's and the um, utilization of stuff like that, as well as micronized purified flavonoid fractions. People aren't paying for stuff where there's phenomenal data. And that's another huge barrier to outcomes in these in these types of um wounds and getting people to be able to use them on a routine basis. I mean, we're, I think everybody on this call is very database. Um, Dr. Armstrong, you produced a huge part of that data that we follow and try to apply to principled patient care. So uh, it, it's a challenge. There's barriers. It's an enigma, but man, there are great opportunities. I yeah. think uh, and, and globally speaking, you know, like the uh, 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 whatsoever is happening in the, um, especially at the uh, skin level, uh, be it venous disease, be it diabetes, has a lot to do with the uh, microcirculation because wow. actually, you know, most of our circulation is going through the uh, tiny little vessels. And what we are talking, when we are talking about the uh, glycocalyx and all factors involved at the uh, glycocalyx level, which is that uh, for our large audience, this is this protective layer that we have in every single vessel. And uh, that that is the key to understand everything, because if we have the edema, it is because these small vessels are leaking. Now, the the other side, it's also the question that the lymphatics are not functioning very well, and they are not uh, repairing that that flow of the uh, fluid that is going into interstitial tissue. And I think that we know more and more right now to really uh, understand and to have the countermeasures. Uh, and, and nobody is laughing uh, anymore and the uh, uh, lymphatic drainage uh, issue or the, uh, the, uh, the compression therapy, all the um, elements that can improve the patients with the uh, diabetes and other pathology because actually in arterial pathology, you have always the question of ischemia. And once you have ischemia, sometimes it's reperfused, but then you have the uh, the uh, uh, ischemia reperfusion issue and edema once again. Is there is there a great paper, Dr. Armstrong, that you're aware of that shows absolute beyond a shadow of doubt qualitative uh, findings that edema reduction accelerates wound healing? If yeah, there was the a couple of papers you're going to cite, what would you tell us? Well, I, I sent you that one. It, it was a really fun paper to do that. That one that we did, I think it was in Archives of Surgery, which is now JAMA Surgery. That was way back when, I think. And uh, it was so much fun. This was a, um, I'll just tell you about the study and I'll tell you about maybe ideas for, for other ones. So that one was um, people with large wounds with diabetes after they've had limb-threatening uh, infections. And so they had post post-operative wounds. Um, all with you know high risk for amputation, and um, we randomized folks so that we had a computer kind of random randomized folks into either a getting a foot level pump. Now this was a device I don't even know if it exists anymore, but it was a uh, the the uh, um, if, was was it called a plexi pulse? If I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. this is quite a long time ago, like a quarter century ago, um, and uh, it it um, engaged the plantar venous plexus. Um, and really the whole foot, and it really squeezed hard, uh, unlike some of the other, uh, uh, you, you know, segmental compression devices that I think many of the listeners will be aware of, all of which, you know, I think have a lot of promise. This one, though, was really powerful. It went up to like 125 millimeters of mercury, so you could really feel it. And then, uh, and then it would just kind of pump along, and so very, very strong. And we randomized people either, either the device that worked or a device that made all the lights going on and the sound and everything. The doctors couldn't tell the difference. 
the patients didn't know because of course they weren't they had never had the therapy before but it, it just had some slits in it that that made it less effective it just wouldn't pump up so it was really blinded uh, the only person that knew was the person that was pulling stuff out and actually putting it on and taking it off and he in this case was not part of the rest of the study so the interesting thing in that study as i'm remembering now i mean you're really taking me back man this is like old home week now talking about this was that uh there was a significant signal in this uh, um, favoring. I think folks were at least two or three times more likely to heal these very large uh, post uh, uh, limb sparing incision and drainage procedures with wounds with uh, that with in the group that got the edema reduction versus those that didn't. To my knowledge, that's the only one uh, in in uh, diabetic foot. Now there, of course, are data showing. I believe. Um, in uh, that uh, certain types of, uh, and of course, I'm sure the assembled brilliance on this panel could probably speak to these as well, that in for venous, uh, for venous leg ulcers, that um, uh, uh, using um, certain types of compression, uh, you know, like four layer compression may be better than other types of compression devices. But I think those are the uh, data that I'm aware of. I'm sure there may be others uh, that, that exist that are, that are even better um, but those are ones that, you know, to which I'm aware, but it just stands to reason that if you are able to control edema, if you're able to milk it up more proximally, if you're able to create a, 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 a new novel kind of, you know, through, through kind of uh, lymphangiogenesis or something else along those lines for all the listeners that have uh, uh, lymphatic disease, if you could do things like this, where you can create more of a kind of a seed bed uh, for the for, for all this to flow back all the better. But if you're at least, if you can milk it up, you can bring those cells that you were talking about a little closer together um, so that all those nutrients can get out to heal wounds. All of that stuff that's in between cells, that interstitial fluid is profoundly pro-inflammatory and it's just bad. You know, if you want to sound smart and who doesn't want to sound smart, right? I'm trying, <laughs> clearly failing. I'm sorry. But there's hope for all the listeners. Uh, uh, if you, after you listen to this podcast, just like take a sip of whatever you're drinking uh, and like shake your head and look at whoever you're talking to and say inflammation and like <laughs> put down your drink and walk away. And they will say, wow, she's really smart. And she, cause she's right. It doesn't matter what you're talking about. You can be talking about pretty much anything associated with chronic disease and uncontrolled Poorly managed or insufficiently managed inflammation is the bane of our existence. And measuring and managing that is like the way forward. So there you go. Inflammation. And, I, and I'm hanging out in the cornfields of southern Minnesota, right? That's that's where that's where I live in in this small clinic in Rochester. That's awesome. And and I love hanging out with farmers. I would treat a thousand farmers a day if I could. And the the analogy I'm now using consistently with with this really wonderful, loving group of people is. And we had, I think, the third heaviest uh, rain season ever, you know, wow. this past spring. So the farmer fields were flooded. We were always talking about how everything, oxygen, nutrients, soil pH. And what makes sense to them is when I tell them your drain tile isn't working in your leg. So the drain tile is basically the lymphatics. That's how we're going to unflood your leg to get you to yeah. heal. So here's the what we have to do. And we use a lot of this fuzzy whale stuff called edema wear, which has dermal lymphatic stimulation. It acts like circumferential MLD at or manual lymphatic drainage at eight millimeters of mercury. We'll put some short stretch on that. We'll do good wound uh, bed debridement, uh, pH mitigation. Wow. But I think drain tile. And if we, it, because part of the issue with uh, lymphatics is it's not taught in medical school. No. They're still teaching the uh, original form of Ernst Starling's 1896 Starling <laughs> function, which which shows 90% of fluid goes back into the vein when we all know 90% goes into the lymphatics based on the revised model. And how do we help teach our colleagues, medical students, podiatric uh, students and residents and our colleagues that the drain tile is a critical component yeah. of bodily health? And it's the imaging, it's the, uh, and how do you, do better imaging. Eva Sebeck, Caroline Fife, they're doing phenomenal work at UT Houston with near infrared fluorescence imaging with microdosing and designing green. Yeah. But that's not ready to go prime time. So, I mean, these are some of the barriers we're against, but we got to get the drain tile working. 
So my question is because, of course, you know, we are talking about the uh, the science uh, and uh, what we know, what is done now, super fantastic. But do you do you need the uh, lymphatic images uh, to treat the uh, the uh, currently the uh, uh, leg ulcers? Do you do it? So, so I'm going to tell you, Monica. I, I, I say we need to do what we say we're already doing, uh, right? And, and I think uh, a lot of clinicians will talk about, you know, get, keeping these patients, um, you know, really uh, doing the best we can with good quality nutrition with our patients, doing the best we can with good quality diagnostics. But I feel like I fail my patients all the time, and I'm always trying to do better by them. We have, uh, for instance, dietitians now in our clinics along with, we have, it's like a movable feast, our clinics uh, with uh, interdisciplinarity. We have physical therapists, uh, we, uh, there are PT wound care specialists, we have occupational therapists, do a lot of behavioral health, we have dietitians, we have, a, we, have a, we call it toe and flow, where we have podiatric and vascular surgery in there, as well as prosthetists, orthotists. What I will tell you is, um, I am constantly trying um, better and better tools. You were talking about uh, ICG, um, you know, like lymphography. And we've been working with ICG since forever. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, obviously, you, you mentioned what Dr. Fife's doing in Houston and uh, and others. I used to work, you know, really closely. I don't know if you know Marlise Witte. Uh, I oh, yeah. but down, down in Tucson. Oh uh, yeah. So when I was in Tucson forever, and she was in our clinic, and she's of course. I call her the, we call her the lympha diva. <laughs> but, but, but so we would do a lot of old school lymph syntograms uh, with her as well. But we do not, I don't think, do this consistently enough on all of our patients, many of whom have not already had a diagnosis of, uh, of, of lymphedema. Uh, so I think there is probably an unmet need and maybe... Our, our diagnosis may be a little more capacious, it may be a little more broad, and maybe some of the more uh, useful therapies, the, the, not only the nutritional, but the physical and the surgical and medical might be, uh, you know, that maybe there might be more opportunities to intervene and make a difference uh, in, this, uh, in this patient population. But again, I, I feel like I need to do better each and every day uh, with my patients, and I'm always... Uh, but the good news is, is my patients know the extent of my incompetence, which is great. Vein Formula 1000 and Lymphatic Formula 1000 from Vita Support MD are backed by science and sold in doctor's offices. If you're a physician who may be interested in prescribing or selling these excellent nutraceuticals, please call 862-246-7877 to speak to a representative today. I want to jump in for a second because, Mark, you reminded me of something we talked about being with the farmers. I was listening, I was listening to a very, um, very good talk by uh, Warren Buffett. You know, they call the the wizard of uh, the wizard of uh, Omaha. Right. And uh, he was talking about the University of Nebraska and the football team there, how proud they are of the football team. And Mark is an old football player like myself. And they you know, most of the football players, they hope to go on to the NFL, but most don't. So they, they have to have some kind of major. And most of them, most of them will, uh, you know, out there uh, major in agriculture. And so, so they, they say to the, to the players, what do you think the N on the helmet stands for, son? And he says, knowledge. They say, very good. So, then they say, look, there's only there's only two questions on the final exam as a senior to graduate. So they say, good, that's good. He says, now take your time and think. He says, okay. He says, your you know your your diploma, your degrees, depending on this. He says, okay. He says, okay, son. He says, what did old McDonald have? <laughs> says, oh my God! He starts to think and think. He says, a farm. He goes, that's right. That's right. He says, now we're halfway home. We're halfway to graduation. He says, now the second part, how do you spell farm? And he says, oh, now he really starts to sweat, you know? He says, E-I-E-I-O. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I thought you were going to say? 
I thought you were gonna say I thought you were gonna say P H A R M. Yeah, that would be that'd be way too difficult. E I E I O. So all joking aside, let me jump in. I think that you know the show has been so productive over these last almost sixty episodes in two years. Wow. Because one of the things that I think that we keep coming around to, and Mark has touched on Monica, and then Dr. Armstrong just brought back around with the multidisciplinary approach, which his amazing team at Tech uh, Medical School and USC is doing. And I, we all know we've talked about this, has tremendous roots at the Mayo Clinic, the idea of a multidisciplinary team sure. and approach to healthcare. Um, but we talk about it with our lymphedema patients, our lipedema patients, our chronic venous insufficiency patients, of course, our diabetic patients with vascular disease, that this is a, these are uh, multidisciplinary diseases that cannot, there's no, there's not going to be any magic bullet, um, you know, silver bullet, however you want to put it. And as, as the folks in the wound care world like to say, and I think it's such a wonderful, you know, expression or dictum, which is don't just treat the whole in the patient, treat the whole patient. And it's easier said than done. And, you know, we've gotten into some some very deep science here already today. I just want to say for the for the folks listening, one of the things that I say over and over is that there are great doctors um, and they're not all great, but there are great doctors and there are great centers like the one at USC and the one at Mayo and many others across this great nation and uh, the one in Nebraska, uh, you know, to, teasing the, the, the guys at Nebraska and all over the country. But one of the things that we have to remind ourselves, each of us as an individual and as a patient, is that our role as the patient is as important or more important than all of the physicians, therapists, clinicians, researchers combined, that we have to do everything we can to follow the instructions, to follow the diet, to follow the hygiene, to follow the exercise, to follow the elevation, compression, keeping our appointments, and so on and so forth. I I think it's a relationship. I had a professor, Dr. Goldfarb, in general surgery, who's a brilliant man. He always used to say, it has to be a concert between the patient and the doctor. It can't be a contest. He sure. said, no one ever wins a contest. It has to be a concert. So the doctor and, and all of the Healthcare folks on one side of the equation have to provide care and present knowledge and options and opportunities for healing. And then the patient has to really take full advantage of that and participate. And the problem with that is uh, that we've talked about a lot on this show is that's a lot of very, very hard work. You can't candy coat it. You can't, you can't put a glycocalyx over it. You can't candy coat it. It, it. It's hard work. It's hard work to follow your dietary and nutritional instructions, hard to keep your body mass index and your weight to where they should be, hard to do the exercise, hard to mobilize, hard to put the, the compression devices on, hard to keep your appointments, hard to get to your appointments, hard to take your medications. This is hard stuff. And I, I think one of the things that the the program needs to bring to light and shed light on, which social media and the mass media and magazines and many other things don't shed light on is the truth. And the truth is that these are difficult problems and solving difficult problems is is hard. And we we all have to work hard at it and patients need to engage in that. And as I always say, I'll leave it with this thought. If you're getting care that you think is suboptimal, if you're getting care that you don't think is helping you the way it should, find other care, go for other opinions, see other doctors, see other clinicians, because they are out there, but it has to be a team a team effort. Dave, you have any thoughts on that? Dr. Chubak, I want to just jump in for a moment sure. because I see... So many lymphedema patient, lipedema patient, phlebo lymphedema. That wow. means venous insufficiency combined with lymphatic insufficiency. And any swelling of lower extremities almost without failure comes fr from uh, someone who referred the patient for the lymphedema clinic. That is on water pill. 
or Lasix. And that is not the treatment that we want to see today. And if the patient is not responding, well, then double the dose or triple the dose. We want to teach the physicians as well uh, to evaluate the problem. And if not possible, then send the patient to someone else. And another aspect of this would be also patient's compliance. I had a wonderful patient about a week ago, which he was already diabetic with mid-tibial amputation, one leg and partial amputation of the foot on the other leg. And I was looking at him as a whole, and we talked about a diet. And he said, how could I eliminate my donuts from the diet? That was one thing. And another thing was, how I, I look at his abdomen and I said, how much bourbon do you drink a day? And his wife was just saying, thank you, thank you for addressing this. So the patient's compliance is so important. So we have to work together. We have now many uh, fantastic physicians, knowledgeable, and we can share the information, but if the patient is resisting, uh, we are not going to have a good outcome. So we have to work together as a team, as you, Dr. Chubak, pointed out already, and it has to be a harmony, it has to be a symphony between a physician treating these diabetic wounds or phlebolymphedema or lymphedema and the patient's compliance. And I, w- I wanna make just three brief comments on FARM, P-H-A-R-M, right? We, we've we really been blessed recently with these GLP-1 agonists that have come out. So here we are for the diabetics. It helps with uh, sugar control. It helps decrease weight. And the trifecta is it decreases major adverse cardiovascular outcomes, right? So improved cardiac, improved cerebrovascular, a huge win. Uh, and the other big thing is if we look at medication list, and Emily, you talked to diuretics, we also need to look for angioedema causing medication. So if you see Norvasc, amlodipine, high-dose calcium channel blockers, even high-dose Neurontin can cause angioedema. For sure. We need to look at that part to get rid of or mitigate. And then, you know, start looking at uh, what I call fruits from the garden. And you start looking at micronized purified flavonoid fractions, the data from Europe, 12 RCTs. Monica was a big part of those, some of those RCTs, one meta-analysis. And uh, and then you look at the arginine, glutamate, uh, hydroxymethylbutyrate, uh, uh, substances out there as well. We got to start looking at these and really figuring out how to incorporate these as a, a checklist. And John, one more comment. You'd made uh, a great comments, but I just wound care is just fun, isn't it, David? You come to work and it it is just, I have never had so much fun in my life being 100% committed to wound care. And it's like a joy every day. I love walking in the room and just saying, look at the patient. I just say, tell me a story about your wound. When was the last time you didn't have a wound? And let's go from there. And, you know, if you can sit down and and just listen, it is, um, they'll tell you the diagnosis, I think, 80 plus percent of the time. And it's it's so fun to go on that journey backwards and forwards with patients. And and, and David, I'm sure you and your team do very similar things because you guys have really, your team is so inspirational, so aspirational. I think you guys set the standard for the United States on what we should all try to accomplish as an integrated uh, team for wound care. Well, that's uh, that's that's uh, very kind, but you're just describing it. I I think it was Osler who used who said famously the famous doctor from you know, 120 years ago. He said, "Be quiet. Your patient is trying to tell you what her problem is." <laughs> right, right. Yeah. I, and, uh, and and um, and that's you just said it there, Dr. Molly, and, and that's and so so very often uh, you know. We talk about him, and and you know Emily was already talking about you know folks being non-compliant and non-adherent, and you know we it is this stuff is 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 hard, but just as, but just because it's hard doesn't mean it's not fun, and doesn't mean it's not worth you know a life's work. Uh, but the 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 point is you know you want to be doing something with that patient, with her, with him, not you know not to them, yeah. and and that's easy to talk about on a podcast. But and doing it in real life is is another thing. And I see these master clinicians here that all of you get a chance to listen to uh, now on this podcast. And it's, it's just uh, life affirming for me, too. But what's fascinating for me, especially in people with diabetes, is that folks with diabetes, they, they wear these 
they get these wounds. They wear holes in their feet, just like we'd wear a hole in a sock or a shoe because of neuropathy. And so while they may be looking just like us and, and, and dressing just like us, they're not going to act like us because they don't have that painful feedback. And so mm-hmm. working with them uh, is really, really important and spending a little bit of extra time. And that's where all the different clinicians, you know, physicians, surgeons, nurses, therapists come into play. And when you put all that stuff into play, it, it really does help, but it does, it is hard. But like I said, I think you've, the great news now is that this stuff is getting less exotic. You're starting to see centers open and uh, all around the United States and all around the world and people that really care about this problem. And it's not just the, all the assembled brilliance on this podcast. It's, uh, it's and it's fun. Yeah. And and you, I, you know, you bring up a great analogy about Paul Brandt, right? And what he did for the leprosy colonies. And he wrote that wonderful book called The Gift of Pain. And I, I think you look at his servant, servant leadership and he, he had yeah. a missionary evangelical style. Yes. And and that's what we should aspire to because we're dealing with very much the same stuff. Folks, sh- I don't know if we can put it in the show notes, but folks uh, should uh, look at uh, that paper by or that book by Paul Brown, the first one, which is, I think, uh, pain, the gift that no one wants. Uh, he was one of my great mentors. This is a surgeon uh, that uh, spent a lot many years in with his with his uh, wife, Margaret, who is an ophthalmologist by the way, uh, in in uh, in India and in Calgary and treating people with leprosy and people with leprosy get the similar wounds to people with diabetes. And so a lot of what we learned about the diabetic foot, we learned about, and wound healing in general, we learned from Paul Brand about, and folks with leprosy. And, you know, um, he said that these, that leprosy is, you know, not, and these wounds are not heaven sent, but earth born is what he said. Mm. And uh, I'll bring it totally full circle. You mentioned Paul Brand, Mark. And, uh, you know, today, uh, every Wednesday morning, uh, my friend uh, Maria Teresa Ochoa and Brandon Adler, two great dermatologists, uh, and uh, to a lesser extent, me and our team, we have now the largest remaining leprosy clinic left in the United States. It's at uh, County, at uh, LA General. Uh, and uh, we treat those patients, and many of them actually also, just to make it confusing, many of them have diabetes too, <laughs> as well as wounds. So it's amazing. Uh, there's still several hundred folks with, with leprosy that we're treating in that uh, in this part of the country, in this part of the world. So bringing it all home. Thanks for reminding me, Mark. I'd like to yeah. I'd like to jump in and just say one thing because I know exactly what Mark and, and David are talking about. But for our for our viewers, just to be very clear, extremely clear, um, when Dr. Moline says that he thinks treating wounds is fun, I want to be very clear because I know for wound patients, wounded patients who go to the wound care clinic and have had long standing and chronic wounds and are having a very difficult time healing, I know it's not it's not fun for the patient. Yeah. Um and when and when he says that it's fun, I don't want you to confuse that with it because I know Mark very well. He doesn't mean to think that it's funny or entertaining or anything like that. What he really means to say, and, and Mark, you can you can uh, agree, and I know you won't disagree. What he means is there's a great sense of fulfillment, a great sense of satisfaction. And myself, I've often said this uh, as a cardiac surgeon who's done some quite remarkable operations in my life, including heart transplants and pediatric heart surgery and um, stopping and starting the human heart and and having done some really quite extraordinary things. I have often said, I don't think there's anything more satisfying in in medicine um, than healing a longstanding wound. It's a great, great sense of satisfaction because you restore someone to being whole again, to being healed again, and getting back um, to a life that is in many ways unrestricted again, socially and in terms of self-esteem and so on and so forth. So I just want to make clear that's exactly what Dr. Moline means when he says it's fun. It's just, it's it's very fulfilling and it's very rewarding. Mark, would you? Would so you I, I, yeah, I think it's really important to clarify this point. I actually walk out of clinic many days so dissatisfied with myself. Uh, I'm so competitive that I want to win. And when patients come back and we start a plan and, you know, reading Dr. Armstrong's, you know, m- m- papers, 
one of the hardest things in medicine is in wound care is making the correct diagnosis. If we go down the wrong pathway, it's like going on the wrong pathway in cancer. And David actually wrote a phenomenal paper on how wound care is like cancer care. It was a, I think it was an editorial that was phenomenal. And I've actually taken that editorial and shared it with our staff. And I said, we have to make this wound clinic work like a cancer clinic. Easy access, make the right diagnosis the first time, get cost-efficient treatments and eliminate recidivism. That's what's going to make us successful. And so I'm challenged personally with meeting those metrics. And so, but what it drives is it drives an intellectual curiosity to do better and collaborate better. And I think across the nation, we need a super club of wound expert um, clinics that integrates and shares openly because we're not in competition. You know, this is this is a competition against the beast of wound. So the the joy and the fun I have is the drive and the intellectual curiosity to excel, to do better. And sometimes that means looking way back in the past at historical things because uh, the historical stuff, if I look what Dr. Brandt did, if we applied those same principles routinely every single day, we'd be doing much better, actually. So I guess that, that's how to put it back into perspective. And I'm glad you brought that up, John. What, what do you think, David? Oh, listen, what you said. Because <laughs> that, that's, yes, I mean, I, you, I couldn't put it any, uh, any better. Again, I think the analogy to cancer is rather apt, right? I, I mean, uh, this problem now is more expensive. If we just did nothing, but if we didn't look at any other wound type of wound types and diabetes right now, this is now, um, believe it or not, more expensive in terms of direct costs than the five most expensive cancers in the United States. This is true also in Health Canada, in the EU. It's true in England, uh, in the NHS. And there are plenty of people right now having discussions and I'm sure having podcasts about breast cancer and colon cancer and lung cancer and skin cancer, and they should be. But I guarantee you that we happy few are the only right now, the only people having a chat about this. And so you want to talk about an unmet need and, and, and a chance to affect really positive uh, change. Uh, uh, it, it, it's that and, and, and doing that and, and organizing these programs uh, around the United States, around the world with clinicians. Um, so we're nursing the wound, we're doctoring it, you know, and with the patient at the center uh, of it. Dr. Armstrong. Think, yeah. yeah. Let me interrupt for a second, and I, I'm going to ask a question or a couple of questions that I think would be really pertinent um, for our for our listeners, for our patients who are out there who are not surgeons and wound experts and physicians and so on and so forth, who may not understand this subject as well. So I wanted to ask a very basic, fundamental question: When a patient has a wound, why is why do we hear so much about? a diabetic wound versus a regular wound. What is it about diabetes that makes it harder to heal than for someone else who might have the same wound or a similar wound, but not no diabetes? Yeah, so uh, I'll give uh, everyone a little, not you guys, uh, but everyone uh, like a little uh, 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 homework assignment uh, if they're listening or if they're driving, don't do this. But if you are, <laughs> then you can pull out a pen although no one even has pens anymore, but you can draw three <laughs> circles, almost like a radiation signal, so, you know, symbol, like one of those Venn diagrams. And in one of them, I want you to put W, because that's for the wound. Uh, and then in one, in one, another circle, uh, I want you to put an I, and that's for ischemia. That means bad blood flow or poor blood flow. Uh, it could be for Dr. Chubak, uh, an ischemic heart, uh, or it could be an ischemic foot and even a wound. So that's the I, so the W, I. And then the other one, the other circle, you can say foot infection or just infection, but let's just say foot infection. And that makes an acronym Wi-Fi. And so when you're talking about someone with diabetes, they not only have the, the tissue loss, uh, which they get um, through a whole complicated series of problems, but specifically because they wear a hole in their foot with their neuropathy and they can't feel when we would normally, or before they had diabetes, they, they could feel that pain. They don't feel the pain. They wear a hole in their foot. So that's the wound. But on top of that, there is bad blood flow off into the extremity. So there's not only a problem with the landscaping, that being the wound, there's problem with the irrigation. That's the, that's the blood flow down to the wound. And then finally, 
the FI, the foot infection, is kind of almost like a forest fire there. It's a, it's a, that's the, that's the problem uh, that could lead to uh, rapid tissue loss because of an infection and higher risk. And so when we are looking as doctors uh, uh, and nurses, when we're looking at those patients and where we're looking at your leg and your wound, we are, we are assessing each one of those things as kind of none mild, moderate or severe. And that's how we can predict uh, outcomes. But there's your Wi-Fi. Now you have your PhD in diabetic footology. Very good. Mark, do you want to talk a little bit for our listeners about, uh, for example, in diabetics versus non-diabetics, the, uh, just before you go, I know you've got to run, but the um, function of white blood cells and the role that they play in healing. Awesome. Uh, so the, Mike Davis down in University of Missouri has done some great work on this in the lymphatics with Josh Scallon, who's now down in Florida. And looking at what high blood sugars do to this sugar layer that you mentioned, John, called the glycocalyx. At Vita Support MD, we believe in creating the best bioflavonoid based supplements to support your vitality. Bioflavonoids are found in abundance in nature and support excellent health and wellness. The demands and stresses being put on our bodies in these challenging times are unlike any we have seen before. Support your body with the flavonoids it needs to fight inflammation and oxidation. Unlike other products in the marketplace, Vita Support MD dietary supplements use micronized flavonoids for optimal absorption and effectiveness. Micronization is an advanced process which creates an ultra-fine powder easily absorbed by the body. At Vita Support MD, we are passionate about making your good health our life's work. So you're, the entire 60,000 miles of your vasculature, so the triad, arteries, veins, lymphatics, from the two centimeter aorta the size of your thumb down to eight microns, which is one third the size of your hair, um, and the vast majority of that's that microcirculation that Monica had discussed before. It's all negatively charged. So you have red blood cells that have a negative charge because they have their own glycocalyx. So th when they get into those eight micron vessels, it's a negative charge versus a negative charge. So they stick, e they're, they're away from each other enough to drop off oxygen nutrients. White blood cells are negatively charged too. When you have high sugar levels, it changes, it, it mows down the glycocalyx. So now you've lost this protective layer. The white blood cells can go stick. The, the platelets can stick and cause inappropriate blood clots. But when the white blood cells stick, they, for lack of a better term, they puke out their guts. And all that stuff is super caustic. Now, there's times where that's really necessary. If I put a toothpick into my finger, I want the white blood cells to go to that area and fight. The problem with our patients in chronic wounds is they get stuck in this chronic inflammation where the white blood cells just stick, 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 and it's all it ends up being inappropriate. Uh, and so we have to turn off that messaging reset it, get rid and a big part of that, I think, is getting rid of the edema, which decreases inflammation, which gets the immune system functioning, which reestablishes the glycocalyx and gets back to what we call homeostasis. Don Ingber out at, in, in Boston at Mass, I think he's at Mass General, described this great term called tensegrity. And it really is how everything in the body from the, the big muscles down to the little endothelial cells with the sugar layer. They're all very, very dependent on existing in a certain state. It's kind of like a tent. I was camping and up along the Ontario, the northern Minnesota border with Ontario two weeks ago. My tent gets stronger with a wind. It gets weak, you know, and it's not as strong when there's no wind. It's the same with our cells. They need a little bit of stress called shear force. They get stronger and they function better, and they're going to prevent those white cells from sticking. So, um, that's that's a really long, hopefully not too detailed question about why white blood cells can cause so much dysfunction, not just in diabetic feet, but also it's well known in venous leg ulcers. It does the exact same thing by sticking and causing so much inflammation. Right, and for, and for that's a great explanation. But for our listeners, I would I would kind of 
take it down a notch and just let them know that in diabetics, because of chronically high blood sugar, we know that white blood cells, which are our fighter cells that help with infection and help with healing and help with the inflammatory process, they don't function as well as people who do not have diabetes. And that's one of the reasons we do all that we can to keep your blood sugar under tight control so that your white blood cells function much more normally and can have a normal response to infection and um, outside um, outside um, elements like Mark gave that perfect example of, a, let's say, a dirty toothpick in your finger. You want your white blood cells to go there and kill the little bacteria, the fungus, and all the little microbes that are attacking. So you don't want them so that they're so diseased, the white cells, that they don't do anything. And you also don't want a hyperactive response where they cause uh, excessive inflammation. So it is a little bit complicated, but I just wanted our listeners to know at least that much. Mark, you want to say one more Well, I wanted to open Pandora's box because Monica and I have had this ongoing conversation all about diosmin and diabetes. And really, there's some great emerging data, uh, Monica, that have really opened my eyes in the last 10 years about how this may become a prime time player in management of diabetes, correct, Monica? Absolutely, and and um, coming to the uh, uh, white blood cells, actually, in the uh, that is uh, truly the uh, explanation why the micronized purified uh, flavonoid fraction is uh, so good for the uh, venous ulcers healing because we have the proof. In the uh, from the clinical studies with patients with chronic venous disease, that indeed uh, the uh, the bioflavonoids are uh, decreasing that sticking of the leukocytes and the uh, migration of the uh, leukocytes into the tissue, and that's the uh, like key mechanism for the anti-inflammatory. Uh, activity of the MPFF. And that's uh, that's also the mechanism that it's used to explain that it might be very beneficial in uh, diabetes. Beautiful. Yeah, Hugh, Hugh Wade wrote a great summary paper that we've shared about all the anti-inflammatory components. It, it's uh, even anti-cancer. There's, um, there's some really good emerging data, but, but it makes sense because that's been around a long time. Back in the bubonic plague, when people ate oranges whole with the rind and everything, they they noticed that those folks had better outcomes. And I think going back to even Mediterranean style diet, it's rich in bioflavonoids. That is what our bodies are calling for is kind of that fruit of the earth that 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 really integrates well with our cellular mechanisms. Now, I think it's something that Joe Raffetto is looking at very carefully too. You know, at the at the recent VLS conference, he talked quite a bit about those inflammatory markers and so on and so forth. And even and Joe's, the, and Joe's uh, another great glycocalyx guy. Yeah. And he, wrote, and he, he and, he and, he and uh, uh, Dr. Roxon and uh, Sergio Giassani were the first to show the glycocalyx in a human lymphatic specimen. They published that in Nature just last year. Yeah. The other thing that Joe brought out at the VLS meeting, which I thought was fascinating, was all of the genetic predisposition uh, and uh, genes related to to wounds and non-healing. I thought that was fascinating. Don't know how much we can do about genes at this stage of the game. In the future, there, that will happen, but it, but uh, it does explain John, why. I, I, I might interrupt you because uh, the uh, nature is absolutely fabulous because there are some genetic uh, defects that you can my, uh, not completely heal, but at least improve the uh, the patient condition of the person condition with uh, some uh, supplements mm -hmm. like vitamin B or the uh, the other vitamins so uh, it's not like the uh, the pure fiction that the uh, you have a genetic somehow problem and there is nothing to be done now there's a lot of things that you can do. You know, and, and David brought up Dr. Osler's name before, and I remember being in a, a practitioner's office, and on the chart was a quote by Dr. Osler. It said, if you don't like your varicose veins, find different parents, <laughs> which, which, right, it speaks back to that genetic component. It's like our, in so many ways, we're gifted and blessed from our parents with just, we, none of us would be sitting here without parents that really loved us, 
and cared for us and um, neutered us to this point, right? So, but we do end up with some other stuff that sometimes can be impactful. Yeah, exactly. Well, I thought it was very interesting when Joe gave that talk, because for those of us who have treated wounds for many, many years, sometimes, as we all know, it can be frustrating in in that you've done everything you possibly know how to do. And occasionally you have a non-healing wound that really is stubborn and can put up quite a fight. And to me, it was sort of an aha moment to say, hmm, I wonder if some of these people over the years have had a strong genetic predisposition because you've seen patients with much worse wounds who are diabetic, obese, have many risk factors, et cetera, and you get them healed. And then here's this one wound that you just, you can't seem to put out that fire. So I thought it was a fascinating insight. And also, I think that certainly uh, in in one moment, uh, specifically in the pathologies like the uh, diabetes or lymphedema, I think that we should probably have like a startup for the patient's uh, treatment, which is much more intense. Because, you know, I was thinking, you know, France is the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, really the, uh, the country with very well developed this, uh, uh, spa treatment and so and so and so. And I think that there is a very good idea in that, that you take a patient for one week and you teach him how to cook, how to, uh, dress the wound, how to, exercise and they it, it's like they are launching the whole machine that will be much more affecting that it's just you prescribe and you say okay so you come to the wound center you will see that it's 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 much um i think it's much more efficient simply when you have somebody from the very beginning taught how to proceed with uh, his or her life. Mm-hmm. Oops, sorry. I, I think that, Paul, we um, have come to the, unfortunately, the end of our time. I know Mark has another meeting to attend. So I think that um, with that, I'm just going to ask David Armstrong to give some final closing thoughts, um, anything he might want to share that he thinks we may have missed out on, and specifically something to say to the public, perhaps, uh, David, Regarding diabetes and your best advice for how diabetics should look after themselves. Yeah, I think that's a, both a hard question and an easy one. But what I would tell them is just move. If you, I mean, I think that's easy to say on a Zoom and again, hard to do in real life. But if you could just adhere to this, uh, and I always tell my patients, even those with neuropathy who can even get a worse wound, I say, if you're going to get in trouble... I want you to get in trouble doing something, not doing nothing. Uh, and uh, I, that may not be good doctrine, but maybe it's good advice, I guess. But I, uh, because the, the good news is now uh, that this is the best time, not only to be alive, I think, in the history of humanity. I think now we, we can bring technologies, we can bring teams uh, to these terrible problems that have uh, plagued humanity now for time immemorial. Uh, and, and especially now, these chronic diseases. Um, and this is the most exciting time uh, to be doing this. So I'd say just move. And every, and if you get in to see your doctor uh, on, a, uh, on an annual basis, make sure that you knock your socks off and that they look at your feet because you can stop so many problems just by that and reduce, almost eliminate amputations just with that if you get out in front of this stuff. Um, great. great advice. Mark, any final? Uh, yeah, I, I, I would add um, your body is about, what is it, 70, 80 percent water? Drink water and stay hydrated. And, and it improves the blood flow into those little blood vessels. And I think if you eat from the garden of Genesis 1, 1, you know, heavy in bioflavonoids, heavy in um, good, clean vegetables, uh, you're going to do well in the long run. And there's a lot of data to support that. And I think times you got to forgive yourself. I think a lot of our patients are very hard on themselves. They look back and how they, their journey and how they got to that point. And I always say today is August, you know, 24th, we got to go from here and you just got to forgive yourself and move on. And we're going to get this thing healed and you're going to do fine. I think it's a great, I think it's great advice. I think one of the pieces of advice that I like is to 
Carter, you know, to Mark talking about that diet, eating whole foods, eating foods that don't have any ingredient list on the package. Mm. The, the package should say apples, oranges, banana, right? That's, that's it. If you can't recognize the food for what it is, then, then don't eat it. Don't eat apple pie, eat an apple. Don't eat chicken nuggets, eat a piece of chicken breast, uh, and so on and so forth. The closer you can get to whole foods as they exist in nature, I think the better off you'll be, even when it comes to sweets, even fruits and things like that. Processed foods, highly refined foods, Dr. Eicher has talked a lot about that on our program, should be avoided. And movement, uh, Dr. Uh, Armstrong would love to meet Dr. Barry Franklin sometime from Detroit, who has done so much good work on walking and the power of walking and walk while you can so you can continue to walk. This is great advice for all of us, but particularly for diabetics. Um, and with that, I think, uh, Paul, we better go around and say goodnight to everybody. All right. Very good. You want to take just a moment? Because I know Dr. Moline has to leave. Uh, Dr. Chubak, can you thank our special guest for us? Sure. I want to thank Dr. Mark Moline and Dr. David Armstrong. It was a real pleasure and a privilege, a little unusual for us, but I wanted to have it this way, to have two guests together because they're both such key opinion leaders and thought leaders in the area of wound care, wound healing, and um, in in the case of both of them, really, uh, diabetic care, vascular disease, et cetera. And we're finding out that all of these um, kind of fictitious um, separations that we put between disease processes are just that. They're, they're fake um, divisions that help it, make it easier for doctors and patients to think about problems. In the end, we're one organism, one human being, and all of these systems are working together in concert, and um, they need to all be attended to, starting with the mind, starting with the spirits, and then moving on to each of the organ systems to keep us as healthy and well with a quality of life for a long period of time. So Mark, David, thank you so much for being here today, reinforcing those ideas, and we look forward to having you both back again in the future. And I'm, I'm going to make just one comment. It was a real honor to be on the same platform with Dr. Armstrong. And, you know, when you talk about leadership in the United States for us in wound care, David, you set the standard. So, you know, for oh, all man. of us as a whole in the United States, we really do appreciate what you do. God dang. You just made my whole year, man. God dang. <laughs> I second that emotion right back at yeah, you. Yeah. Hey, guys, this is really, really great. And uh, what a great, just great assembled brilliance here, man. God dang. Yeah. All right. <laughs> E-I-E-I-O. <laughs> I think you have to buy a vowel for that, though. <laughs> I need a K. <laughs> and and you, can't use that, you can't use that word in Scrabble either. <laughs> All right, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate you, the listener, uh, listening to our show, LymphCast, been episode 59. Every show is on every podcast platform under the sun and also on YouTube. Visit our website, lymphcastnetwork.com. Let's uh, thank the members of the regular panel from California, Dr. Emily Eicher. Dr. Eicher, thank you very much for tonight. Thank you. Thank you, wonderful team. And thank you, Dr. Mellon and Dr. Armstrong for a very, very educational podcast. Yeah, yeah, very well said. From Arizona, Dr. Monica Glavitsky. Thank you, Dr. Glavitsky, for everything. Thank you for having me and thank you for uh, our wonderful guests, Dr. Malini and Dr. Armstrong. And I'm looking forward to the next episode and in the future for again having you in this show. Yes, we will get them on for sure. The gentleman who started the show, the founder and owner of LymphCast, also the founder and owner of Vita Support MD. They make Faint Formula 1000 and Lymphatic Formula 1000. Physician and surgeon from New Jersey, Dr. John A. Chuback. Dr. Chuback, thank you, sir. Thank you, Paul. It was a great program, and uh, we look forward to the next one. Absolutely. Again, thank you for listening and or watching LymphCast episode 59. We'll see you next time for episode 60 of your LymphCast show. Have a great night. Thank you.